Settle in, class. Time for a heartwarming story of a widely disliked class turning into one of the better ones. That's right, I actually like a lot of what they've got going on now. You're not gonna think I do in the intro, but trust me when I say that I do recommend this class if it's interesting. Hopefully the new version, but honestly the old one wasn't that terrible. It was just frustrating for the wasted potential of a core concept. Anyway, this one has a lot to cover, so let's skip the intro gag and dive straight in. You ready? Let's go. First off, what's a ranger? We've been trying to figure that one out for decades. They're a martial, magical, wilderness jack of all trades. Too many adjectives. The stereotype has them as wilderness archers, but they can be a lot more. They've got the second highest HP, wield all weapons, and use all but the heaviest of armor. They've got good strength and dex, and they get magic at half rate. Half rate magic isn't entirely accurate, however, as most of it's rare and unusually powerful. 26 of their spells are exclusive to them in Druid, and 9 of them are unique to the Ranger. Barrages of arrows, tangling bows, making traps, it's all really cool and won't matter for most. First elephant in the room, Hunter's Mark. It's a first level spell that makes you do extra extra damage to a chosen target, and when they die, you just choose the next target. It lasts 1 to 24 hours depending on the spell slot, and that right there is our problem. You can only have one concentration spell active, and what's going to be better than extra damage on every attack all day? And yeah, you're not forced to use this spell, but the biggest complaint with Ranger is that if you aren't using this spell, you know you're doing much worse than you should, especially after level 5 where you get an extra attack. This is a third attack's worth of damage you're leaving, maybe more, especially weird because it's basically a replacement for your old favored enemy feature. But we'll get there. First, let's look at the positives. Fighting is a bonus action or sensing invisible creatures. And at level 2, you get a fighting style like the fighter or paladin. Choose a benefit like higher AC, better attacks with ranged, or dual wielding, or one-handed. If you have Tasha's Cauldron, you can also choose thrown weapons or extra spells or seeing with your eyes closed. Either way, though, you're gonna want Tasha's Cauldron. It's full of fun optional features for all the classes, but for the ranger, they're more of a balance patch. She even added a subclass change. Ranger is this rare case where they've tried reworking it repeatedly over the years, and this is the result. Level 3, for example, would normally let you spend a very limited spell slot to know if a category of monster exists. Not where, or what, or how many, just that there is at least one fey somewhere within a 6 mile radius. Thank you, Ranger. That narrows it down to 113 square miles. And is that a pixie, or a coven of elder hags, or Tasha the Witch Queen herself, who says no? You gain the first of 5 spells, and you can cast them without a spell slot once per day. Normally level 10 lets you hide very well if you have an entire minute's prep time and don't move after. Tasha says you can turn invisible for a few seconds a few times a day, and that you gain temporary hit points occasionally and heal from exhaustion much faster, as opposed to one more favored terrain. And here we see why this is the biggest intro. Oh, what I could say about favored enemy and terrain. They're cool in theory. Favored enemy lets you choose a type of creature or two species of humanoids. You speak their language, you track them down better, you know all about them, and you gain two more as you level. And at level 20, you can even add your wisdom modifier to hit or damage them. Not both, just one. Others become invincible, you sometimes get plus 5 damage if any creatures even exist at your power level. Nobody really plays level 20 anyway, but it shows you how much they cared. Tasha fixes this with favored foe. You pick a monster a few times a day and deal extra damage. It's like a mini hunter's mark. As for favored terrain, pick a natural terrain. You get bonuses to learning about it, you can't be lost in it unless there's magic involved, you can travel stealthily more quickly if you're alone, you're twice as good at foraging for rations, and other equally useful things, assuming you're traveling for at least an hour. Good luck finding a table that even engages with all that, and if you do, you better hope the adventure never leaves that biome, or goes to a city, or a dungeon. Now, granted, you also get more terrains as you level, but they don't get better. Tasha says that your core adventure features shouldn't shut off because you adventured. Instead, you learn two more languages. You double your proficiency in a skill. You become faster. Get a climb and swim speed. You become more resilient. They're still relatively minor things, but they'll actually be used. These are features that bake in so much role-playing, really marry you to your backstory. I love that, but what are your options here? Choose based on your backstory and half your features might be useless. Choose based on your campaign and you're really limited in backstory options or get weird conflicts. And however you do it, you're putting pressure on your DM for where they can go and what they can use. And the worst part is that both favored features are tame even without the restriction. Favored enemy was restricted in previous editions because it gave you extra damage or chance to hit. They made that your level 20 ability but kept the limit anyway. And as for terrain, did they just take that from Pathfinder 1E? Because I'm I'm not seeing it in other editions. If they did, it was a minor bonus feature among many others for a reason. This was a great concept, weak execution, and one of the rare cases of Watsi admitting it. Not sweeping it under the rug, or hiring mercenaries, or smashing random bits of design and claiming the wreckage is fixed. They saw the problem, they tried to patch it. But honestly, even before that, the Ranger was worth playing. And how can I say that after dragging it through the mud? The Ranger is one of the many classes where the subclass makes or breaks it. Level 3, 7, 11, and 15 get you cool features we can 
now finally talk about. The ranger is primarily known for one particular class, one where you work alongside a creature, it gets stronger as you do, and all of your features revolve around it. That's right, the Drake War, the Beastmaster, which at launch was arguably the worst subclass of fulfilling its fantasy. Now if I was smart, I'd commit to that fake out and string you along to make you watch longer, but I think we're gonna take this book by buck for once. The Beastmaster fell prey to that reoccurring theme of good idea, flawed execution. At level 3, you gain an animal companion of your choice. At 7, you can have a dash disengage or help as a bonus action. At 11, it can take multiple attacks or use its multi-attack action. And at 15, your self-target spells also affect the beast. Sounds great, but the issue is the animal. It can never be more than CR 1 quarter, so at best it's a frog or a bird, maybe a dairy cow? It adds your proficiency to its attacks and AC, and its HP is 4 times your level of its last. But at the very best, this is a farm animal that you could have beaten solo at level 1, which you're now sending to fight some abomination in your stead. Yeah, that's right, it takes your entire action to have it fight. You're a Pokemon trainer, except your bunny isn't magic, you monster. And you know what happens when it dies because you just threw a house spider at a giant robot? You can spend 8 hours finding a new one. Everyone else's familiars just get resummoned or reformed, but yours is dead. And a lot of DMs make you stick to animals in that area. These animals aren't companions, you're just chucking a random fish you found at someone. You'd be better off just using Tasha's summon animal spell. Or at least you would be if Tasha didn't save us one more time. In the new version, your companion is one of three set stat blocks that get stronger as you level and can take the form of any animal you like. You can bring it back from the dead with a spell slot, grab a different form on a long rest, and can make it take any action other than attack as a bonus action. And while I personally crave the variety of having all the beast stat blocks, I have to acknowledge that most people prefer the simplicity anyway. And rarely even I'll take it because your animal companion can stay with you. It can be an actual friend, not dinner with benefits. So now you're a real Pokemon trainer or whatever monster friend analog you want to use. Everyone's on Pal World right now, but I like Monster Sanctuary. Anyway, even ignoring the biggest multimedia franchise ever, this is a classic. The person in the woods raised by animals and now riding with them, or made pact with nature and now it comes to their aid. You might have enchanted animal hides that fill with life and help you, but the concept of having animal companions predates written history. I don't think I need to explain a concept that's older than the species I'm talking to, so let me take a moment and say that I know I've been harsh so far. I actually really like the ranger, but that's the problem. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't care, but I want the things I like to succeed. I love finding the potential in things and what the designers are going for. Cool ideas and the heart behind it matters so much to me. It's why I keep falling in love with so many things that are bad. I mean, come on, one of my oldest fandoms was Sonic the Hedgehog, thanks to Sonic Adventure 1 and Sonic X. But when I look past the flaws, I do still need to see something, and having this be the only bonded creature that can die was just too far. Thankfully, they did fix it, and before half of you click away because the bad one's gone, do me a favor and hit that like button or subscribe. I could really use the algorithm smiling on me right now. Anyway, the original counterpart to Beastmaster was a surprising instance of actually getting it right. A hunter is a person what could kill things good, but what and how do you hunt? That's actually a question you're getting asked every level. At 3, you can choose between extra damage on wounded targets for hunting hardy prey, an instant counterattack against large creatures for giant slaying, or an extra attack on a second creature to take out the whole flock. At 7, it's defensive, either fighting off fear, getting extra AC when a creature hits you, or evading attacks when you retreat. 11 lets you attack a bunch of creatures with either melee or ranged, and at 15, you can divert attacks that miss you to hit other enemies, or you can steal either evasion or uncanny dodge from the rogue, reducing dex save damage or using a reaction to cut normal attack damage in half. That is a lot of choices, but the choices matter, and they're all useful, so if you're taking one to tie into your backstory, it's gonna be fine. This is the sort of customization that favored enemy and terrain were going for, but done better. And I know that everyone says this should be part of the base class, but let me tell you a little secret. The Hunter is a this but more subclass, or as I like to call it, class plus. And every time, people say the same thing. One option being better or more common doesn't make everything else a trap. Extra damage on wounded targets is more reliable, but a counterattack against large creatures is still useful. You're gonna be basing those. So for characterization, we look at what and why you hunt. Are you a simple backwoods hunter used to hunting geese but now shooting methods? A soldier trained to fight giants on the outskirts? Are you fighting to protect others or collect research samples or just eat? Maybe you're not a hunter. You're a drummer learning that hitting seven things in quick succession is great for fighting hordes. You're a panicked noble whose fear turns into speedy retreats and quick shots. A disgraced fencer stumbling out from under a bridge to repost attacks and take their pocket money. Or maybe you're a monk traveling the world to learn from everyone you meet. That's why you're hard to hit a second time and do more against damaged targets. You learn to read him quick. But even if you're just stalking prey, animals aren't the only things you can hunt. The monster slayer as I just described it. Dragons, ghouls, liches, CEOs. The unnatural kind of horror. You gain spells to ward off or banish. You can learn their weaknesses a few times a day. And do you remember that alternate option for your favorite enemy? At level 3, you pick a creature and do extra damage. It's a little different, but it's the second class book and you can already see them figuring out things for the rework. Anyway, as you level, it gets easier to resist saves from your targeted foe. You learn a once per rest counter spell that also works on teleportation and can't be counterspelled. And finally, when you need to make a save against an attack,
attack you can preemptive strike, and if that attack lands, you automatically pass the same. The hunter is the king of called shots. You point at the board, you f this clown in particular and just shut him down. The hunter probably started out catching game in the woods, while the slayer is your dedicated hunter of supernatural dangers. It's Van Helsing, a witcher, a monster hunter. Your town was overrun by undead as a kid and now you want revenge. You grew up obsessed with a type of monster and you know them inside out. You studied local history and started preparing because you know the animated armor invasion of 1387 will happen again. They always come back. But if an edgy noble with favorite foe humanoid just isn't your cup of tea, get weird with it. Maybe you're a scholar or a wildlife researcher and you know about these because you love them. Maybe it hurts because you're fighting the thing you love. Or maybe the party is breaking out and trying to stop you from butchering them. Or given the options listed, maybe you're more of a spicy monster researcher. Have I ever mentioned I actually have a project far more popular than this? It's called D&D Smash Your Pass Versus. Smash your pass for the qualifiers then put them in a tournament. Gonna change it to TTRPG Versus eventually when Pathfinder finally wins a poll for the next book, but um... Some of us do a lot of research into the sentience and abilities of monsters for all sorts of reasons. That's a really judgmental look for someone in catapult range. Anyway, on a similar vein, the Horizon Walker. Monster Slayer focused on all sorts of threats, but Horizon Walker is focused on extra planar ones. You can sense the direction of planar portals once per day, you can change your damage to force damage with extra damage on top, and you gain spells to protect or enhance yourself. Really good ones too, like Misty Step and Haste. Also notice a trend with these classes, extra spells. And guess what got added to the main ranger class later on, at the same level. Cool, right? We're getting to watch them work out their design. At level 7, you can step into the ethereal plane for a turn, walking through walls and traps. At 11, you can teleport before every attack and get an extra attack if they're against different creatures. Teleport away while shooting and run. Teleport through trees while fighting. And if you're melee, warp through the whole line of minions. Especially at level 15, where you clip out of reality for a second to resist an attack's damage. This is a ranger that knows all about the different planes of reality and is using the monster's own power to keep them there. Or are you? You could be a ghost hunter who learned their tricks, or maybe you're a revived ghost who's only mostly bad. Maybe you're keeping the pain in their world and learning to teleport to keep up, or maybe you're you're letting out your own fey blood. Maybe your powers are a boon from a god or another monster to hunt down their kin. And maybe they weren't learned or given, they were stolen. After a series of successful hunts, the leader of your order invoked a blood ritual to give you the power of your prey. And are these abilities even on purpose? Or as you hunt, are you slowly infused with planar power? The magic of the realms corrupting you through extended exposure. The deeper you delve into the hunt, the more monstrous you become yourself. One day your order might be after you, good hunter. Or maybe you became that corruption intentionally. There are plenty of creatures that go bump in the night and you'll become become one yourself if need be. That is the Gloomstalker, hunting the monsters where they dwell before they can become a threat. Your spells that you hide, disguise, spread fear, your foe's own tactics. Not only do you have dark vision, you are invisible to others' dark vision, which means that while you're in the dark, you'll usually have advantage on all attacks and they'll have disadvantage to hit you. You're also a master of ambushing, gaining extra initiative with more speed and damage on your first turn. At 7 you gain wisdom proficiency, at 11 you gain an extra attack if you miss, and at 15 you can use a reaction to force disadvantage on any attack that doesn't have advantage. You make a lot of monsters advantage into a sudden weakness. And that's not to mention how much utility you have and how incredibly sneaky you are. Greater invisibility is one of the best spells. And not only do you have it, you basically get an infinite version as long as you're in darkness, which isn't hard to get in a dungeon. This might be the best assassin build. I'm sorry, rogues, but this is a deceptive terror. The monsters look under their bed for you at night. You can go with the classic options, of course. Inquisitor, bounty hunter, drow in general, and don't forget the edgy backstory. Your village was burned by a dragon, so now you're gonna be their nightmare. You're from the planet shadow so the darkness treats you as its own. Or you can get fun with it. You sold your shadow to a hag and now you can take its place in the darkness. Or maybe you are a shadow that escaped and gained form. Or just be a minotaur or something. The bigger and flashier the better. Make your enemies wonder how you even got in here. I mean heck, you're invisible. Go big. Be a cheerleader, a mariachi player. Put on something bold and flashy and fun. Wearing bright orange makes disappearing even more impressive. The sneakiest person wearing sparkles and streamers is always a wonderful juxtaposition. But now let's move on to the next era of design. From Xanathar's to Tasha. So what did they come up with now that they know what they wanted to be? Combining those last two ideas. You're a horrifying, teleporting, extra planar monster who's great at fighting their kin. That's right, you're a fae. You scar people's mind with psychic damage when you hit them, you get charms and teleportation magic, and you add your wisdom to charisma checks. As you grow stronger, you resist fear and charms and can bounce bail charms back at other people. And it doesn't have to be against you or even your own sign. If someone resists your charm, you can just bounce it to someone else. You can also summon fae once a day for free, and eventually get an even better misty step. It's fun, it's 
flavorful. It's not going to distract me. What did you expect me to have fun ideas? Oh, look at the bay you can emulate. Be a hack spawn or a fairy messing with mines and warping away. Maybe even make an Overwatch joke about being Tracer with all the teleportation and natural charm. But I know what this is. I could never forget. This is just a Shadar Kai. Can't hide your special elves from me, Watsy. Not anymore. Did you know that Shadar Kai didn't used to be elves? They were Bay, but got reworked because Watsy wants everything to be special edgy elves. Oh, did you think my rant about the 33 types of elves was all I had? Never. Oh, but there's a line that gives you fun cottagecore flavor. It just wants you to be an Aladrin. But I saw that dancing shadow bit. They just put this here to make your elf more elf and tempt you into darkness. No, 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 no. I love teleportation, but let's warp out to some real nature spirits. So you might think the Swarm Keeper is just for making Dr. Bees, but come on, they never make a mundane animal if they can make a bay or spirit pretend to be one. They went against that instinct only once, and we got the original Beastmaster from it. No, this is a swarm of nature spirits pretending to be tiny creatures. Birds, bees, tooth fairies, winged raccoons, you name it. It even says to incorporate them as flavor on your spells. Explode into a cloud of bats like a vampire. I always recommend that anyway, but I'm glad to see I don't have to. You also get Mage Hand in the form of your swarm, and the swarm can help you in a fight. It can move you, lift you, move your opponents, knock them over, add extra damage as they start biting or teleport you to personally dodge an attack. Now, I don't know why they limited the fly speed to 10 feet, but this thing's in the upper echelon of built-in creativity. Be protected by your plushies, or treat with schools of sharks even on land. You're a demonologist swarming with imps, an author whose words buzz around them, an archaeologist with tiny clay statues come to life. Maybe it's more solid with dirt or water bending to your whim. Maybe you're a tired and desperate teacher cursed to a lifetime field trip from hell. Like a less happy version of Zipper from her cleaning crew. A goblin built like Saxon Hale with the mental stability of a feral raccoon. She was the protector of their tribe's nursery and also their biggest danger because she used them as ammunition. She figured they were expendable. These other pansies taking months for a few kids just weren't putting in enough hustle. She could replace the whole nursery in a night if she wanted. No one was really brave enough to argue with her, and it went about as well as you could expect for their long-term survival. But while she wandered the wilderness fighting bears with her teeth, some really messed up bay decided they just loved her style. Now she's always surrounded by goblin whelps, flying by just flapping their arms really hard. Tough enough to survive her training, and they always come back, her dream come true. Anyway, this puzzle has one more piece, something released after seeing our reaction to these changes. One more try to Beastmaster, the Drake Warden. You learn Draconic, though the Thaumaturgy Cantrip is all the magic you're getting. Instead, your magic is focused on your Drake. You have a companion Drake that works like the new Beastmaster, but Dragon. Instead of air, sea, or sky, you choose the color and damage. It also doesn't die, just disappears until you resummon it. It's their usual spirit in the shape of a thing. It starts off small, but as you level, it gets bigger, better, learns to fly, becomes a mount, even gets a breath weapon. And at level 15, you can reduce the damage against it or yourself. Didn't have a good way of working that one in there, kinda random. But what an idea! A common one, to be honest. You're a dragon rider. You can speed through the process of raising one since birth, a trope so well-known it's hard for me to say ideas that aren't just famous stories already. And I mean, you could subvert this by turning it into something else, like a magnum opus construct with parts summoned from the void or an elemental of your own design, but what about exploring that growth cycle? Maybe this is an ancient dragon spirit, but its powers are limited by the body you're able to summon. Maybe it's a normal bonded drake, but what are the effects of aging it years in a matter of weeks? The lore options mention infusing yourself with the magic power of a dragon. What if this is their spirit? A draconic patron controls it while they dream, or a draconic parent is reborn with roles reversed. Maybe it's a dragon that you killed, and now in begrudging servitude. It could even be a willing wormling happily serving to skip its most dangerous years. However you do it, I'm glad that in the end we got some good companion classes. For some, it's all about those companions, for others the flavor of a wild loner, and for others just the mechanical blend. Rogue and Fighter and Druid all together. Those are also my recommendations if I didn't quite convince you. Fighter for combat style, Rogue for creeping around, and Druid for more of that magic and animal power. But hopefully you saw that despite the early hate thrown their way, at this point they are a sterling class. And the sterling members of this class are Feral Goblin, Snake Oil, and Modern Masquerade. My headset broke on the first day of recording, and thanks to you, I could get a replacement. Yeah, I was pulled away for a week and a half, and my editing equipment snaps immediately on return. It has been a month. I was tying it to my head to try to get some work done, and that was surprisingly painful. But if you want to help me afford equipment like them, coffee link in the description. But either way, thanks for watching. Class dismissed. So that blog. It's mostly an excuse for research through a new lens, sharing findings, and gathering data. Regardless, my hobbies are none of your damn concern. Okay, but where is it? I'm the worst influence on you. Mm-hmm.